Hi everyone, welcome to the first session of the NLPS Evaluator 101 training series, Understanding Government Accountability and the Types of Evaluations. My name is Jennifer Sebrin and I'm with the Mississippi Joint Legislative Performance Evaluation and Expenditure Review Committee, or PEER. I will be moderating our webinar today. I'd like to thank the National Legislative Program Evaluation Society and the National Conference of State Legislatures for sponsoring this webinar. NLPES is the NCSL Staff Association for legislative staff involved in program evaluation or performance auditing. One of its key purposes is promoting professional development opportunities like this webinar for legislative staff. So we are pleased that we could bring you this program today. This webinar is being recorded and will be archived on the NCSL website. Over the next 60 minutes, we encourage participation through our chat box, so feel free to type your questions and answer any questions if you can in the chat box, which is located in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. So to build in some comfort with the chat function and to learn about who, who else is on the webinar today, I invite you to type in the state from which you are calling. I also want to mention there are resources for the webinar. Above the presentation you will see a couple of tabs. One is labeled resources. And here you can find and download a PDF version of the PowerPoint as well as other handouts. Another tab is labeled Speaker. This is where you can read biographies for today's speakers. You can access these tabs at any time during the presentation. The instructors for today's first session are Eric Thomas from the Washington Joint Legislative Audit and Review Committee, or the Washington JLARC and Patricia Berger from the Pennsylvania Legislative Budget and Finance Committee. We're going to kick off our Evaluator 101 training series with the very important question, why do we audit? And I'm really excited for all of us to hear what Eric and Patricia have to tell us today about this because they have a lot of expertise in the field of program evaluation. Patricia is the Executive Director of the Pennsylvania Legislative Budget and Finance Committee. She's worked with the committee for over 30 years as counsel, senior counsel, and project manager before being appointed executive director in 2018. And Eric Thomas is an audit coordinator with the Washington State JLARC, where he has worked twice, most recently since 2010. Um, they are also both members of the NLPS Executive Committee, so two very qualified presenters here. I also want to give a special thanks to the founding fathers of legislative auditing and evaluation. These people really were instrumental in getting the field of program evaluation to where it is today, which is that it is very well respected by state legislatures across the country. Max Arinder, who was the executive director of the Mississippi Peer Committee for about 20 years. He retired in 2015. I was fortunate enough to work under him and learn from him, and he really was a great mentor and public servant. Mr. John Turcott was executive director for the Peer Committee before Max, and he also served as the director of the North Carolina Program Evaluation Division of the North Carolina General Assembly until he retired last year. He also worked at Florida's OPAGA for several years. Mr. Turcott was a founding member of NLPS, and he actually wrote a historical description of the formation of NLPS. It's really very interesting. If you have a chance, you can find it on NCSL's website. So thanks to Max and John. Uh, we hope to carry on the great work that they began. But now I'm going to turn it over to Eric. Thank you very much for the introduction, Jennifer. Um, Pat and I are both very excited to give this presentation about um, why we audit. Uh, again, Eric Thomas with Washington JLARC. I've been on the NLPES Executive Committee since 2018 and have been the Secretary since last year. And hi, uh, this is Patricia Berger with the Legislative Budget and Finance Committee. 
Uh, as Jennifer indicated, and thank you, Jennifer, for that nice introduction, I'm currently the Executive Director of the Legislative Budget and Finance Committee, although over the past 30 years I've served in various roles. So this is the first session of Evaluator 101, Understanding Government Accountability and Types of Evaluations. We are going to cover four topics today. Accountability, who we are, what we do, what is the final product. So what is accountability? Well, accountability in ethics and government is answerability, blameworthiness, liability, and the expectation of account giving. It's a noun that describes accepting responsibility, and of course it can be personal or it can be very public. Personally, you may be accountable to a friend, but government has accountability for its decisions and laws that affect its citizens. And the legislature has accountability for the programs it establishes for its citizens. So basically, accountability is responsibility. So what is the purpose of audits and evaluations? Well, obviously it is to hold the agency or the program under review accountable to the legislature and through the legislature to the public by determining whether the management and officials of that program are managing resources and are using their authority properly and in compliance with laws and regulations. It's also looking to see whether those programs are achieving the objectives and the desired outcomes. And whether, even if they're achieving those objectives and desired outcomes, whether those services are being provided effectively, efficiently, economically and ethically. And then finally, to actually determine whether the services being provided continue to be necessary. Statutes are enacted and sometimes just stay on the books for years and society changes. So one of the keys of performance auditing and evaluations is to determine whether the program is actually still serving a viable need. So there are really three key aspects of audits and evaluations. One, oversight, what's working and what isn't. Two is insight, the unintended consequences. And then three, foresight, what is looming. So what questions can be answered through a performance audit? Well, does the agency have policies or methods to help ensure their performance? We call this internal control. How well is the program achieving its goals and objectives? We're looking at effectiveness and results. Is the agency meeting the letter of the law or regulation? Compliance. And then finally, what conclusions can be made about things that may happen based on evidence about the existing practices or policies? Prospective analysis or, as I mentioned before, foresight. So when looking at program effectiveness and results, what would we be looking at? Well, we could look at standards that the agency may have in place or that may be in place in the statute. These could be output standards, how many people received a certain brochure, or outcome standards, how many people completed their GED. So if the agency doesn't have its own standards, what would we look at? Well, we can look at standards that may be set by the federal government. We can look at standards that other states with similar programs may use for their programs. We can also look at best practices, things that the experts who have looked at similar programs have established as a good guidance for that type of program. So what we're doing is we're collecting, compiling, analyzing, and reporting data to measure performance. Now, when you hear the term audit, I'm going to expect most of you before you became uh, a performance evaluator or a performance auditor, thought when you heard audit, you thought financial audit, you thought CPAs. Well, a financial audit and a performance audit are very different animals. A financial audit is going to evaluate the financial standards, it's going to issue a third-party opinion on whether those statements in those uh, financial statements are true, test against various accounting standards, and then simply verify the financial information. 
a financial audit isn't necessarily or isn't going to make any type of qualitative statement about whether resources are being used efficiently and effectively. Whereas a performance audit is an evaluation of the performance or the activity, the agency or the program. What is, what are they currently doing, and what should be? How could this be administered? But then, what isn't a performance audit? Well, a performance audit does not advocate for a policy perspective. A performance audit does not in assert personal opinions about what the agencies or programs should do or achieve. A performance audit does not base its conclusion on information that is biased, unverified, or conjecture, no matter how well-informed or respected the source might be. We're talking about uh, personal opinions about what an agency or a program should do or achieve, what we actually should be looking at is what does the legislature direct that agency to be doing in their statute? What are they trying to, what service are they trying to provide? Uh, what situation are they trying to correct? So the yellow book, GAO's yellow book, has a statement regarding the ultimate goal of of the auditing, and that's government auditing provides the objective analysis to make the decisions necessary to help create a better future. In our office, our mission statement is to provide members of the Pennsylvania General Assembly timely, accurate, and unbiased information analysis and performance evaluation to inform their policy decisions. In both cases, we're providing objective information, or in the case of ours, unbiased information, to allow the appropriate decisions to be made, to inform those decisions. So what do our reports do or what can they do? Well, they can be entirely inf informational. It all depends on what the request is. It can identify what is causing an identified issue or problem or it can be assessing the functioning of an agency or a program where no issue or problem has been previously identified. It just depends on what your office is being asked to look at. And now I'm going to turn the program over to Eric, who will discuss who we are as offices. Eric? All right. Thank you, Pat. Okay, Pat just provided you with a good summary of the many forms and questions that performance audits could take and what they can address. This next section will address the different approaches to conducting this work that our offices take. Performance auditing is a part of the key legislative function, which is the oversight of the executive branch. There is a, a famous quote from Woodrow Wilson prior to him becoming president about the primary value of the legislative branch being that of vigilant oversight of the executive branch, even more so than passing laws. Uh, I was wondering if you felt that, had that same position after you became in charge of the executive, but performance auditing is a key component of the legislature's ability to do so. At the federal level, this work is performed by the General Accountability Office, and our offices are the state analog to that. Although the same function is performed in most states, how it's conducted and who conducts it varies. This is detailed in a report that NLPES puts out every three to four years called Who We Are and What We Do, a National Survey of State Legislative Program Evaluations, Performance Audit Programs. And that's consistent with NLPES's role as serving as a clearinghouse of legislative program evaluation work. So hopefully the following slide will give you a flavor of some of these differences. The first slide, who we are, summarizes the work that offices do, and this is put into four categories. Um, the first being a legislative auditor's office, which is an office that does both financial audits and performance audits. The second group is independent legislative officer unit. 
which is an independent legislative office that conducts performance audits as its primary function. Uh, the third chunk is a legislative oversight committee. That's a committee that spends most of its time conducting performance audits, but also performs other legislative staff work, such as fiscal budget analysis, bill drafting, uh, or analyzing substantive legislation for members. And the final is a legislative committee that spends over half of its time doing non-evaluation, non-audit work. The next slide is office size. And uh, as you can see, over half the offices have fewer than 25 employees. Um, one, one thing that is masked a bit in this, and there's quite a range within um, the offices that responded. That's from a small of a one person shop in Oregon up to three offices with over 100 employees, Arizona, Michigan, and New Jersey. Not surprisingly, the number of reports that our offices issue really varies per year and is obviously correlated with the number of staff, but also depends on the issues that we're asked to look at and audience expectations. What, what is it they're expecting? Thorough, in-depth reports on difficult topics or a series of quick reports? In this final slide, uh, I have to apologize. Uh, any of the graphic experts in Washington Jailer for watching this, they're rightfully cringing. Um, what do our reports contain? And it gives you a flavor of recommendations, um, some of the comparisons that are made. And one theme that I, I would note is that um, the two most common features of our reports are recommendations to the legislature for action or recommendations to the agencies that we're reviewing for improvements. That's actually a good segue into Pat's next segment, which is what it is that auditors do. Thank you, Eric. So what is it that we as auditors do? Well, as I like to describe it, I think it's the absolute greatest job in the world because you get to go in to tell people who have been doing a job for years, a job that you've never done, that they are doing it wrong and how to do it better. But with that said, the other thing that we get to do is we get to learn about all aspects of state government. You're not necessarily working in the same uh, general topic area all the time. You also, at times, really get to see the value of the work we do. And with that, I'd like to read um, a brief portion from an article that our counsel, Rick Jones, uh, wrote for the 2019 Summer NLPS newsletter. And I would encourage you, first, if you haven't, to re read the newsletters because there's really good information in there. But also, um, after I'm done with this, you may want to follow up and read the entire article. Uh, in this, Rick was talking about a work he did when he was on the team that was looking at Pennsylvania's organ and tissue donor awareness program. And during this, he had one not-so-typical meeting where it showed that our work is not simply a detached policy exercise, but relates to real life and real people. During this meeting, they were doing a tour of one of the organ procurement organizations. Toward the end of the tour, an individual from that organization came into the room pushing a cart on which lay a pulsing human kidney. Now I'm going to read the, the next part of this I'm quoting directly from Rick's work. Over the years, I have visited rural as well as city offices, met with police, liquor enforcement, executive senior staff, and the judiciary. I have had explained to me the science of biometric smart cards, viewed blighted property, studied the use of fingerprinting, explored the potential for commercial advertising on public property, and considered, paren, beyond what I would have thought possible, close paren, various aspects of game, fish, and boats, including the merits of agency mergers and the social aspects of hunting on Sundays. I have addressed issues with constitutional implications and spent much time analyzing the importance of the meaning of words in statutory interpretation and construction. 
I've watched people convicted of drunk driving cry openly as they listen to survivors share their stories of extraordinary pain and loss. And I have even trudged across foul-smelling farm fields, treated with human biosolids, all in the name of program performance evaluation. In retrospect, though, having a human kidney pulsing on a cart directly in front of me, without doubt, was unlike any other project-related activity before or since. That moment helped me not only visualize the importance of organ donation, but also gain a healthier understanding about what we do and how it connects to real persons and real life. So, how do we do our work? Well, to begin with, we're professional skeptics. By that, it means we, we check to see that what we are told or what we read is actually what is occurring. We do that through observation, we do it through monitoring performance. We send surveys. We send surveys to agency staff, uh, agency clients, the general public. We conduct file reviews. And for those of you who have only, you know, always think that the file reviews are going to be easy because everything's electronic these days, I'm here to tell you that file reviews can still be hard copy, boxes and boxes of um, permit program materials. We had a project like that just a couple of years ago. We also conduct a literature search, which is an, a great way to come up to speed on an area you haven't worked with a lot in the past or something you may be totally unfamiliar with. However, I will caution you that Wikipedia is not a final source document. It's a starting point at most. Obviously, we meet with agency staff and we meet with stakeholder groups. The best evidence, however, is the observational, direct observational or physical evidence. An example of that is a few years ago we did an audit of uh, the costs associated and the implementation of Pennsylvania's right to know law. And of course we sent surveys and talked to agencies and had ongoing conversations with some members of the public. But we also decided to do a 500 phone call test where we called 500 of the agencies, a mix of agencies, both from the state level, the county level, uh, local, school districts, et cetera, who are covered by the act, and asked for a copy of what was clearly a public document, which could very easily be provided. In fact, it could have been pub published on their websites. Well, in some cases, our request was uh, kicked up to council to review agency counsel, who then denied it, by the way. Uh, other cases, the individuals told us they wouldn't give us the information and hung up on us. That type of information in our report made a big impact on the legislators who then read the report and, and made uh, changes to the program. Uh, best evidence, again, direct observation, physical, documentary, again, is probably the second best, and then testimonial should always be used more as a supplemental type of information. So how do we get our evaluations? As Eric pointed out, we all do the same work, but we don't necessarily do it in the same way, and we don't necessarily get it in the same way. What's reflected here is pretty much what we heard from all different agencies about how uh, you get your work. So it can be a statute. It can be a resolution. It may come through an individual member of the General Assembly or state legislature. Um, a, some agencies, their staff bring topics to um, their oversight body. Um, a lot of times, stakeholder groups will bring the work. I know in uh, my experience, stakeholder groups tend to work through members of the General Assembly and will then get a resolution adopted that will have us do our uh, work under that resolution. So what do we do once a project comes in the door? Well, we have to take what sometimes can be very imprecise requests and translate those requests into objectives for the study or for the audit. And the goal here is to develop them as precisely as possible in order to have clear direction for planning, field work, and reporting. Uh, 
sometimes this can be very difficult if you're given a very broad request and the legislator doesn't necessarily know what uh, they're looking for. Uh, but without more precisely stated objectives, there's always a risk that the work isn't going to produce what the desired results are. Um, therefore, it is always important to define the issue. In some cases, uh, I know when we get a resolution in the door, we contact the prime sponsor to find out uh, the history of the resolution. Why did they want that work done? To make sure that uh, we include their specific interest area. Um, this issue area about how to uh, translate a request into objectives is going to be addressed in more detail in uh, the next uh, Evaluator 101 session. So we mentioned earlier that Max Arinder is one of the founding fathers. And during a presentation that he did in 2016, he stated that evaluation is the art of systematically investigating the worth or merit of an object, an operation, or an idea from a variety of critical perspectives. Well, why is it an art? Well, much like our offices are slightly different in size or um, in the, the body that oversees our work, the work we do does not have rigid rules for data collection or methods decisions. Now, we have standards. We have the GAO Yellow Book. Some of you uh, belong to offices that are Yellow Book offices. Others use that as guidance. And then your office may also have its own standards. But each study is different. And what you're looking for in one study may require a different type of activity um, or design for data gathering than another uh, type of project would. So there's no cookie cutter report. There are overarching guidelines, but each study ultimately stands alone. So with that said, what is the expectation of our work? Well, the expectation is that we're going to identify problems if there are any. We're going to identify the issues that cause the problems. And we're also going to make recommendations to address those problems. I think it's also important to note that we're also going to point out where things are going well. Part of an evaluation isn't just to point out the problems, but it's also to say where, where things are working well in an agency. But our final product, and Eric will be discussing this in a little bit, needs to be understandable. And it needs to be understandable by various audiences who have different levels of information related to that particular topic that you're looking at. The report needs to be fair. It needs to be available to the public. Our reports are specifically included in the definition of legislative record in our right to know law. So we are required to provide them. Now, we always did, even prior to uh, that law, but they, it's just stating how important it is that these reports are in the public eye. They need to be supported by substantial evidence. They need to be defensible and stand up to scrutiny. If there's an observation being made, a conclusion made in the report, or a recommendation being made in the report, there has to be substantial evidence as the basis. It needs to be nonpartisan, objective and include reasonable recommendations. So talking about accountability, when I started my earlier presentation, I said there were the accountability that's personal, and then there's very public accountability. Well, not only are the agencies accountable to the legislature and the uh, citizenry, but we as auditors are accountable. So we're accountable to the legislature that we're going to provide them that fair, objective, substan substantively deep report. And how do we do that? Well, we, we through, do it through various standards, ethical standards, which includes that objectivity, professional behavior, independence. This includes both actual independence and perceived independence. If someone reading the report believes that 
you were swayed because um, they know you worked for the agency last year, um, they're not going to believe what's in the report. So even though you believe you were able to separate that, there may be that perception. At the beginning of a project, you know, everyone working on that project really needs to make that determination whether there's anything either actual or perceived that would keep them from working on that particular study. Uh, professional judgment, again, exercising reasonable care, and again, that word skepticism, professional skepticism. Competence, knowledge, skills, abilities obtained from education and experience. Now, we're not all experts in the areas that we look at, but we should be able to put together a team that through their knowledge and skills and abilities together can do the work on a particular project, on a particular subject matter. And then, of course, continuing education, such as the education that you're having today with one of NLPES's webinars. And then finally, the GAO government auditing standards, uh, which I mentioned to you earlier. Now Eric is going to discuss the final product. Eric? Thank you, Pat. Um, this will build upon um, some of the comments that Pat just described about um, what is contained in reports. Um, one of the things that is required of a final product is an easily understandable descriptions of the functions that are reviewed. That's key, remembering who our audience is. In Washington State, we have a citizen legislature, and these are people who have full-time jobs outside of session, sit on various committees, and oftentimes just don't have the expertise that you might gain after studying a program for a year or 14 months. Um, so taking that detail and being able to distill it into an understandable description that they can work with is important. So again, sounds easy enough. Um, simplify a complex issue for legislatures. The challenge is that legislators are not the only audience you're writing for or working for. Um, you need to provide detail to support the findings and recommendations to convince an expert in the area that our findings and recommendations are valid. This is important because it's often the agencies that we're evaluating and they're responsible for implementing recommendations. They need appropriate detail so they can implement the recommendations and have the confidence in doing so that what you're recommend, recommending is indeed an improvement. And finally, reports require recommendations that are vetted to avoid unintended consequences. At least for Washington State, we're often charged with looking at programs within a larger agency, so perhaps um, the maintenance function of the Department of Transportation. Important, but just a piece of what they do. So when making a recommendation, how do we know that the proposed recommendations don't break something else or conflict with other recommendations that this agency is charged with outside of the audit scope? And finally, are there unexpected consequences that could result from pursuing the recommendation? And those are all things that need to be worked out prior to making the recommendation. Kind of looping back to Pat's initial piece on accountability, what does a final product look like? Again, it really depends on what it is that you're asked to do, and that varies by the request in the office. Um, in Washington State, all of our reports are solely online, and that's in response to legislators being very comfortable and savvy with IT. Um, other times, it can be a letter, just a simple letter responding to a question from the committee. And other times, it can be a large, multi-volume formal report, and there will be um, more of this will be discussed in session four. And that concludes our prepared remarks. Um, be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Eric and Pat, for your excellent presentations um, during these last uh, minutes.
we would like to answer questions, please enter any questions you have in the chat box and I will be happy to uh, translate those to our, our presenters today. Um, we have one question to kick us off is, how can differences in staff backgrounds help an audit office? Well, this is Pat, and I'll just jump in with that. I, I think it helps because you come at the topic in different ways, and you come up to speed in different ways because of it. We have uh, folks who don't really have a background in state government, for example, when they've come to us, and therefore when they start looking at something, they look at it differently than someone who has worked with government for a while, for example. And sometimes you see something, I mean, you see, you see something or you ask that question because you didn't know about it. Um, same thing with topic areas. If you've always worked in a particular area, it, it's good because you're familiar and you know what the, the, language, you know, the, the, the various languages that's being spoken, but you're then hesitant to maybe ask that quote-unquote stupid question, whereas someone who doesn't have familiarity with it can ask that question because they can state very honestly, it's the, the first time I'm looking at this particular topic. So I, I think it, it just it really helps, and I think it always helps. I'll put a plug in for lawyers here. I think it always helps to have someone with a legal background who understands uh, how to interpret the, um, the, the statutory language that we're looking at. This is Eric, and I would agree with everything Pat said, but also add to that it really benefits the analysis that you can undertake. Um, we have an applied mathematician in our office who looks at everything through a very quantitative lens and does some amazing analysis. Um, but to supplement that then with working with agency staff, giving the qualitative piece to really flesh it out, I think give a fuller picture of what the problem is and what might be the appropriate remedy to address problems as are identified. I think just a more robust analysis. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to ask a question as to, have y'all ever been um, confronted with the words, y'all aren't the experts, we're the experts? I know you mentioned that, Pat, that um, you know we go in and we tell people how to do their jobs better, but have y'all ever had an agency head or staff um, tell you that um, you don't know what you're talking about, and how do you kind of handle that? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> we had, um, and in fact, I know um, at least one or two people from our office who are on this will know this story. Uh, we did a project a couple of years ago with our Department of Environmental Protection, and we were looking at um, water permitting, the water, two of the water permitting programs. And um, we, we found several issues with the programs, but on the front end of the project, we told them we, we weren't second guessing whether a permit should have been issued. What we were looking at was the management of the permits. You know, how long did it take them to go from point A to point B? Did they check all the boxes? That kind of stuff. Well, at the closeout meeting with the agency, uh, which was, let's just say, less than pleased with our final product, um, they told us we weren't engineers, which surprisingly enough, we knew. Uh, but they also put that in their written response. Our statute requires that agencies be given a draft copy of the report, and if they include, if, if they provide formal remarks, those formal remarks become part of the report. They're attached as an appendix. So we had an appendix to our report pointing out something that our staff already knew, which was we were not engineers. Um, and we pointed out that we weren't making engineering determinations, we were really making management determinations. So, yeah, we've had it happen. I was told by a psychiatrist at Eastern State Hospital in Washington that as a, someone without psychiatric training, I'd probably have a very hard time understanding what he was talking to me about and understanding the complexities of the work that they do. And um, I guess my response back to him was, 
if we can't understand it, then the legislature is not going to understand it, which is going to be a problem. I mean, it's really they need to help us understand these complexities. And I, I don't think you can go in purporting to be an expert nor claim to be. But th that is why you work closely with the agencies is so you can get up to speed and you can inform the legislature. Yeah, thanks for those answers that I, I agree totally. And I know that people familiar with the profession of legislative evaluation know that we don't have to be experts in the areas that we're looking at. We only need to be proficient in the skills that are required to conduct, you know, an objective evaluation. And um, so that's that's what we kind of stick with at PEER, but I know it comes up um, from time to time. So be ready for that, newer analysts. <laughs> okay, hey, we Jennifer, have Jennifer, if, yes. if, if I can just add one more piece to that. Um, we, we've been told on a number of, of uh, projects um, at the end of the project from the agency staff that they were surprised at how quickly we came up to speed and how well we understood the subject matter by the you know as we work through the project and as as um, Eric said as they educated us and as we learned about it so in general I'd say it's not a problem but you do run into like I said our issue with um, our Department of Environmental Protection uh, was somewhat unique, but um, in general, if you're using your due diligence and doing your work appropriately, you will understand the subject matter to the degree you need to understand it to be able to explain it to the general, uh, excuse me, to the legislature as uh, Eric indicated. Yeah, great. Okay, we have another question here. Is there need of having different staff for performance and evaluation audits, or is it better when the same staff is working on both types of audits? Do y'all have an opinion on that? So I, I, this is Eric from Washington. We typically don't have accountants doing performance audit work. Uh, not to say it couldn't be done, but it found that, I think as Pat described, they are two very different skill sets. Um, so we typically don't have, I think, a, people doing both both types of audits. Not to say it couldn't be done, but that's just not something we've done. Yeah, we we focus on performance audits and studies, so I I don't really have a response to that question. Okay, all right. Um, a question from Taylor in Mississippi: What do you think is the most valuable skill an evaluator beginning their career should focus on? Is being curious a skill? Because I think it's, I think it's a real value if you're curious, and if you're, you you want to learn, and you want to continue to ask that next question. And again, I'm not sure that's exactly a skill set. Certainly, writing is always important, and listening is important. Um, Eric, do you have any? No, I I was actually tough thing because I would agree. I think if you were a curious person, if you were willing to keep an open mind, that goes a long way. Yeah, you mentioned that professional skepticism earlier and I thought, yes, that's that's good. Um, okay, Donna from Wyoming says, thanks Patricia for sharing your hierarchy of best sources, direct observation, uh, physical evidence, documentation, and testimony. Can Eric, Patricia and Eric each provide further examples of recent program evaluations where they gathered information by observation? Well, in the uh, piece that I read from the uh, the summer 2019 NLPES newsletter from Rick, he t he talked about trudging through the. Uh, let me see if I can find the the exact language here. Um, 
you know, trudging through the the farmlands and waste disposal areas um, to see how how things operated. Uh, but I'm trying to think of something uh, beyond the right to know law one that I gave you. Um, let me think about that. I'm hoping Eric can jump in. So this sounds extremely mundane, but um, we watched staff with the Department of Social and Health Services actually physically enter information um, about a competency stand trial order and how they did that and um, how it was prioritized. And again, not, not terribly exciting field work, but watch it done at two different offices, realize it was done completely different and you're getting completely different information out of those two processes. Um, and that was done via actually standing and watching them, understanding how they were entering that information. Those are, yeah, good examples there. Okay, um, looking here to see. Um, Peter asks for auditors without formal accounting training. Is that something that they should pursue in order to advance in their auditing careers? And um, I'm not sure what uh, state you're with, Peter, but um, that may be a very office-specific um, question. Um, but if if you have any thoughts on that, Eric and Patricia, um, for Peter. Jennifer, I think my response would be yours. It's going to be more agency specific. We've had CPAs on staff. We've had individuals with accounting degrees on staff, but we don't have a, um, a particular position that is an accounting position that, you know, uh, you would work toward. I, I think it's a skill set that could be very helpful. Certainly it, it's another detail oriented skill set that's o always helpful for auditing um but i in our office that's just one other thing that that somebody might might have and might do but it it wouldn't necessarily uh translate to a, a like i said a specific position or a promotion yeah i i would agree with you pat same for our office okay great well, I think, um, okay, we have one more question. How many offices have attorneys involved in their offices for the legislative intent or statutory interpretation and construction? I know we do it here. Uh, we have a general counsel who's involved in a lot of, most of our projects to interpret law and things, um, things like, and legislative intent. What about y'all? Well, we have a council position, and then we also have one of our project managers um, has uh, is an attorney. And then, uh, obviously, since I was council and senior council, I'm also an attorney. But I, I personally think it's very important to have someone who can speak with expertise about statutory construction, because there's a difference in an attorney speaking to an attorney at a state agency about the interpretation of their statute uh, rather than an analyst speaking to an attorney. Not to say that the analyst can't interpret the statute correctly. So please don't, don't think I'm saying that I'm not. I'm saying it's a matter of perception and that's one of the reasons that uh, this office first brought counsel on board back in, I believe it was the early Actually, before my time, um, early 80s, maybe even late 70s, brought counsel on for, for just that reason. I've got a, a quantitative response to that. Um, according to who we are and what we do, 20 of 34 states that responded have attorneys on staff. So, several offices. Interesting. Okay, um, a question from Scott. Sometimes a policy or program structure that looks right for a recommendation 
can be said to be off limits for a recommendation because it is a policy choice. For example, requirements around renewing eligibility for a program. And how does management determine when something is a policy choice and when something is program design that is fair game for a recommendation? I know that um, <laughs> our office does not shy away from um, from policy. Um, I think I think it is a management decision sometimes uh, whether or not that objective, you know, whether or not to go with that objective or not. But uh, again, that may be office specific or, or requester specific. But do y'all have any other thoughts on that? Now, Jennifer, it sounds like, this is Pat, it sounds like our office operates uh, the same as yours. Um, in, in general, we, if that was part of our scope and we, we found a problem, uh, we'd bring it to the attention um, and bring it to attention in the report and make a recommendation as may be appropriate. Yeah, I guess if it was a policy choice by the legislature, we would evaluate it. But if it was a policy choice that was um, part of the cause of a problem, that that would certainly be fair game. Great. Okay. Um, the questions keep coming. Very active group. Thank you all for the questions. Um, what is the most efficient way to produce audits? By having auditors specialize in areas of evaluation or specialize in the management process, interviewers, editors, etc.? Is it more efficient for auditors to be proficient jack-of-all-trade practitioners? Well, I'll answer briefly for our office. We're a small office. Uh, we have uh, 12 staff right now. We're, we're bringing an additional analyst on next month, so we'll have 13 staff. So other than our, you know, resource manager um, and our one other administrative staffer, pretty much everyone has to do everything related to a project. Um, and that has worked for our office, but I think you know, it may depend if you have a larger office and you can have people who specialize more in, let's say, data visualization, for example. You may end up, like Washington State, with some really great uh, data being presented in their reports. Yeah, I would agree. We have um, very talented data visualization staff or admin staff and then also have uh, an editor but otherwise, everyone is a jack of all trades, and I think that just given the variety of topics that were assigned, uh, I think that makes sense for our office. Yeah, same in Mississippi. We're uh, all generalists, and of course, we have a few people who, you know, specialize in certain topic areas just because they've worked on them over and over again. But in terms of like, you know, going through the project process, everybody kind of. You know, is is responsible for conducting all the field work and writing and all of that. So um, I think that's pretty typical of what um, most offices do. Okay, and I think that's all of the questions. So again, uh, thank you to Patricia and Eric. Uh, thanks to all of you out there for joining us today. This webinar has been recorded and will be made available on the NCSL website in the next week. Um, and the webinar is now concluded.